grace to you and peace from God who is, who was, and who is to come. Here the third lesson from the word of God <clears throat> as it is written in Isaiah 40, verses 26 through 31. Isaiah chapter 40, reading from verse 26 through 31. Look up at the sky, who created the stars you see, the one who leads them out like an army. He knows how many there are and calls each one by name. His power is so great, not one of them is ever missing. Israel, why then do you complain that the Lord doesn't know your troubles or care of you or care of your suffering injustice? Don't you know? Haven't you heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. He created all the world. He never grows tired or weary. No one understands his thoughts. He strengthens those who are weak and tired. Even those who are young grow weak. Young people can fall exhausted. But those who trust in the Lord for help will find their strength renewed. They will rise on wings like eagles. They will run and not get weary. They will walk and not grow weak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Those who trust in the Lord for help will find their strength renewed. God gives new life for all. Let us pray. Almighty God, in you all treasures of wisdom and knowledge lie hidden. Open our eyes that we may see wonderful things out of your word and give us grace that we may clearly understand and wholeheartedly choose the way of your commandments through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. God gives new life for all. Those who trust in the Lord, those who trust in God, those who commit their ways to God, those who ask God for help, can wait on the Lord, can depend on the Lord, and God will renew their life. God will give them new strength, and God will give them new energy. Dear congregation of God's people, dear resurrection people, dear Easter people, there are many themes we could celebrate today from each of the three lessons, but we shall focus our attention on Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40 itself has many themes but let me just state here that Isaiah chapter 40 is the, the uh, a text that begins what we call in the Bible, second Isaiah. The book of prophet Isaiah is divided into three sections. The first section is the chapter one to 39, when Isaiah speaks to the people of God why they are still in their own homeland. The second part is when Isaiah speaks to them while they are in exile. And that second part begins from chapter 40. And the third part is when they return and uh, that is called third Isaiah. Now to deal with the people while they are already in exile, Isaiah had the message of encouragement to tell them that even when they have lost hope, even when they have lost their glory, 
God will return them to their land. And that way, Isaiah comes in with the message of God gives new life and God will renew your strength. What is required then is that the people, while they were in Babylon, they were under bondage. They were away from the center of worship. And it appeared to them as if they were away from the presence of God. I'm sure we and each of us do experience, each of us does experience the problems we have in our time affecting our families, affecting our communities. Take for example, when one of us is in the hospital sick, the whole household is upset and we wonder what will happen, what will be the results. Of course, we have to trust the doctors that they will be able to administer medicine in order to heal the sick one. Yet, we will still be in doubt if something good will come out of it. This is the situation Isaiah examined when the people were away from their homeland. Maybe some remained there and they were wondering what was happening to their lot away from home, away from the temple, away from the place of worship. And so Isaiah had to give them this message. But what does it mean simply to say that God will renew your strength and God will renew your life? Isaiah was actually calling on the people. In the first part of that chapter, Isaiah mentioned there that God cannot be compared. Nothing on earth can be compared to God. No king, no president, no scientist, no technocrat can be used to compare to God because God is supreme. God is almighty. God is universal. However, we want to approach God. The first thing we must establish in our minds is that God is above any comparison. Now, having stated that, and you find yourself in difficulty, children will know if they run into difficulty in the street, they will run to their parents and they will think that the parents are the only people who can protect them. Well, in school, they are taught that the police are their friends and the doctors are their friends. And of course the teachers are the nearest friends. Yet they go back to their parents. It is in this sense that we have to call God our parent in heaven because the parent is the one nearest to us. And so God is the one we can run to wherever we are, no matter what other help we can receive. It is in this sense that in addition to administering medicine for the sick, we continue to pray to God for healing mercies. That's how Isaiah saw it. But what does it require to return to God, to commit ourselves to God? It means that we have to wait upon God and receive renewal. That's what Isaiah says at verse 31, which is our key verse for this message. They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. When you wait on God, God will renew your strength. No matter how weak you are, God will give you strength to stand again. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They will run with their wings. That means that they can fly. God will give you wings to fly. God will make you fly again. Flying means 
if you were down and if you were aware and if you were hidden behind the doors because you were afraid of police, God will open that door and will let you fly out because God will be the one to strengthen you and to go with you. They will run and not be weary. It means even sports persons sometimes run and fall on the way. Sometimes they go out of breath. But in this case, they will be given the breath that will take them all through the race and they will never become tired and weak. They shall walk and not faint. There are many people who are doing sports and walking is one of the exercises that has been prescribed. But the elderly also know that even when they are taking a walk as an exercise, sometimes that walk becomes too long. And sometimes they can even fall down and faint. But in this case, what is said is that when you walk with God, you will not faint. Like we said last week, when the people going to Emmaus were walking with Jesus Christ, it was what I call a prayer walk because they were going in prayer, praying that the circumstances in Jerusalem will change and they can return. But they discover that while they in despair, they were with the Lord. Jesus whom they glorified later was the one who renewed their trust in God. And so the point here and the message for you and for me is that we must wait on the Lord. Waiting is sometimes a very hard thing to come by. I once preached a sermon on waiting. It was one of the uh, one, one, one lay Christian who came up to me and said, Reverend Adzimfer, I have listened to sermons after the uh, ascension and before Pentecost, but what you have said today makes it clear. What was my simple message? My message was that waiting is a very painful thing, but it is because of waiting that the church was born and renewed. The disciples had to wait in Jerusalem when Jesus told them, wait until you receive power from above. And it was while they were waiting that they were thinking, that they formulated things that would come on. It, you know, it was just, I mean, some things come as an instant but others come through contemplation. And when they were waiting in the upper room, the 120 deputies who were there before Pentecost day with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the other women who went to the tomb and discovered that the body of Jesus had been taken. And the disciples, when they were gathered there in Jerusalem, it is then that they practice certain things which we do today. And it is then I say, Theology was born. It is in waiting because we, we have a gap. Even now, as we add, we have a gap. Since Jesus ascended to heaven, when Jesus ascended to heaven, until Jesus will come again, we are in a period of waiting. And while we are waiting, we are doing what teachers call theology. That is formulating what we can say about God, how we can understand God, how we can approach God, how we can benefit from the presence of God. What do we do? First of all, we have to set our goals, what we expect God to do for us. We, we allow God to take charge of our lives. We trust God to plan our life for us so that we can have a better future. We hand our children to God to take care of them as they are growing up. And even we who have finished school and are waiting for jobs, we have to trust God that God will help us find jobs. Those of us who are seeking partners to be married to, we will have to wait on God and trust that to God. These are the teachings that the church teaches people how to trust God, how to deal with God. That was formulated while you are waiting. When you are waiting, a lot of things come in your mind. And 
what Isaiah is telling us here is that trust God for whatever you expect. When we wait upon the Lord, God provides all that we need exactly when we need it. We run out of patience because sometimes when we're expecting God to heal us while we're lying in hospital, we think that it must happen today, it must happen tomorrow. But sometimes God takes three days, God takes three weeks, God takes three months. Sometimes God prolongs the time, but we must keep waiting. Just like we are waiting now for the coming of the kingdom and only God can prompt that. What does it mean to wait on the Lord? This is another way we can say, trust God. Waiting on the Lord means you trust God. You trust God. And it is then when we celebrate, each time we have our service and we celebrate the Apostles' Creed. Each time we say the Lord's Prayer, we are trusting God for everything that has to happen to us. And I tell you, the God has made the promise and Isaiah is here pronouncing it to the people of, uh, of, of Israel in, in, in exile, telling them that God loves them and God's love is manifested in the strengthening of the people and in the renewing of their strength. The important thing that distinguishes us is having our strength renewed and getting everything that we want. Having our strength renewed, we have to set our goals. We have to set our desires. We have to outline everything that we ask for in prayer. And so it means therefore that waiting we have to wait in prayer. We wait, we trust. And while waiting, we must be able to wait as part of the process of becoming what God wants us to be. So it is therefore the reason why the church continues to celebrate this worship in order to instruct members that they must trust God and they keep on waiting and reforming their lives, making themselves available so that God can make them to become what God wants them to be. God wants us to become more and more like Jesus. And that's why Jesus had to die on the cross as a model of our dying. And Jesus rose again as a model of our rising. And so Isaiah is emphasizing this, that we must know that God knows what we, uh, it takes to get us where we have to be. God never promised that it will be easy, but God did promise that it will always be done and that God, God will always be with us. In Deuteronomy, God said, I will be with you always. And you can trust that I will be with you. And Jesus, on the last commissioning, also mentioned that, go everywhere in the world and know that I am with you always. Dear friends, I want us today to know that waiting is a time given us to work out our expectations and to hand our checklist, our shopping list, our supplication, what we call supplication to God. And that's why, while we celebrate God's presence, we are allowed to make our intercession for other people, for ourselves and give to God. And so in waiting, the people who were waiting until the coming of the, of the Holy Spirit had to wait in singing. They had to wait in prayer. They had to wait in Bible reading. They had to wait in counseling each other. They had to wait, wait in teaching. And they had to wait, remembering all what Jesus had taught them. They had to revise the commandments that Jesus had given them. And when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them, 
it was then that they had energy to go out and share what they had gathered from Jesus. So as Jesus appeared to them on the shore and reminded them of his presence, while they had been fishing all night, they caught nothing. But the very presence of Jesus and Jesus' one command made them to catch fish such that they could they were not able to pull to the shore. And even when they were able to pull, the net did not tear because God had strengthened the net and because it was the action of God. But they had to believe it. Trust God, my friends, for whatever situation you find yourself today. Wait on the Lord and God will renew your strength. This today is one week after we celebrated the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Today, we can also call the Thomas Sunday, when Jesus appeared to the disciples while Thomas was with them. Today is the day Thomas said, Lord, my God, and worship Jesus. Today is a day we can say, even if your faith were dead, even if you had backslided from the church, even if you had been disappointed somehow, even if you became weak, God renews your strength and renews your faith. Put back your trust in God and you will see what wonderful things God will do for you. All you need is the eyes of faith, a heart of trust, and a mind of remembrance. Remembering all the teachings of the Lord and the goodness of the Lord. And you will have your life in the balance and you will move on and be able to overcome those things that are obstacles to you because you are walking with the Lord and God is standing by you. God is ever present, even in our doubts, even in our grief, even in our mourning, even in our disappointment. Trust God and see what the Lord can do for you. Amen. Amen.